So the first question that you may be asking is, why is an epileptologist giving a lecture at the dysautonomia meeting? And uh, hopefully at the end of the lecture, I will have answered that question. But I will say before that many of the symptoms that people present with, or as you know, people present with symptoms. They don't come in with a diagnosis. So you present your symptoms, you go to a doctor, and you, uh, the, the doctor makes what's called a differential diagnosis from your symptoms. And so many of the symptoms that come from autonomic dysfunction uh, can be misdiagnosed as other entities. And one of the things that, that we see a lot of is people that have been diagnosed with seizures who have, have symptoms which really may be related to autonomic dysfunction. And that's part of what we're going to, we're going to uh, go into today. Also, the autonomic nervous system can be involved with seizures. So people that have epileptic seizures during them, there can be autonomic dysfunction. Uh, and things like heart rates and blood pressures and uh, changes in uh, cardiorespiratory function can all occur at the time of a seizure. So the, first, the second question I'm going to ask is to say, what is a seizure or a non-epileptic seizure? Because we use that word a lot. The, term no, the word non-epileptic seizure would mean somebody who has an event that is looking like or has been diagnosed with a seizure but does not have an epileptic mechanism. So first I'm going to go through some of the various definitions behind this. So if you really look at the definition of a seizure, this, a seizure is a sudden attack of an illness or a disease. So any disorder could have uh, a seizure associated with it. It doesn't mean epilepsy, but I think throughout the years, the term seizure has become synonymous with epilepsy. Now, we will use the term epileptic seizure, and that, is, that term is usually used when we have proven an event is an epileptic event, and how do we do that? Well, we do brainwave testing or EEGs. And so if we capture a, an event, and during that event, we see a seizure discharge. I have here on the slide uh, a seizure discharge is called an uncontrolled hypersynchronous brain electrical activity. So basically, it just means almost like a short circuit of the brain's electrical activity. So if at the time someone has a defined symptom, let's say it's a symptom of syncope or it's a symptom of staring or unresponsiveness, and at the time we do an EEG and we see a seizure burst at that time, well, that proves that that event is an epileptic event. If we don't cap see a burst at that time or we don't see an EEG abnormal at that time, then it leaves out to question, you know, what is that event? There's a large part of the brain, of course, that is that is not seen by the EEG electrode. So someone could have an event. You could have had an event. They capture the event on the EEG, uh, and your doctor says, well, this was not a seizure because we didn't see a seizure discharge. Well, it just means we can't prove it's a seizure. Sometimes for patients with hard-to-control seizures, we will actually put the EEG electrodes into the, into the brain itself to bring the recording electrode closer to where the discharge might come from. We don't do that for what we call differential diagnostic purposes. And then the EEG, the EEG again is, is measuring the brain wave, the, the brain electrical activity. You know, normally certain areas of the brain have certain frequencies, meaning that the electrical activity fires off at certain frequencies. And then if you have sort of like what we would call a short circuit of that, that would be a seizure, sort of a short circuit of the brain's electrical activity. So the, so the term epileptic seizure means we've had an event, we've had some kind of symptom, and we've proven it's a seizure. Epilepsy, the term epilepsy refers to unprovoked recurrent seizures. And what we mean by unprovoked is an epileptic event that happens without any precipitant. Precipitant meaning a fever or sleep deprivation or a low blood sugar. So epilepsy would be recurrent unprovoked seizures. Now the term drop attack. Someone has an episode where they fall. You know, I see a lot of patients that have been referred in with epilepsy because they've had a drop attack. Well, not every time that someone has an event where they, 
lose consciousness or lose body tone and fall to the ground is going to be an epileptic event. So one of the things that I always have to do or we always have to do when we see a patient who's referred in for epilepsy is ask ourselves the question, is this event really epilepsy? So that's part of our job to try to prove it. Because we don't want to take someone who, we don't want to treat episodes that aren't epileptic events with anti-epileptic medications. Because of course, every medication has a plus, but every medication has a side effect. And we don't want to treat our patients with medications that they don't need. Then the term syncope or transient loss of conscious. I know, I know from, from being at the various lectures here today that, uh, that w you've heard that term a lot. But syncope uh, is really a short course or a short time in which there's alteration of awareness or loss of consciousness. So a typical syncopal event would be short. People have said less than a minute. Uh, but you can also lose muscle strength and muscle tone at the time of a syncopal event. A seizure might be longer. A syncopal event, the person may recover to their baseline very quickly, meaning that within a couple minutes after the episode is over, they have recovered. Now, why is that? Well, syncope, why do people pass out? Well, they pass out because the blood flow doesn't get to their brain. And it doesn't take more than a couple of seconds, you know, maybe four to five seconds of not getting enough blood to your brain where someone will lose consciousness and pass out. But if, they are, if that mechanism or if that event is coming from not getting enough blood pumped to your heart, when you, res when you go to the, into the flat position, that almost automatically restores your brain blood flow. So you may recover from that episode r relatively rapidly. Whereas someone with an epileptic seizure, they might uh, take an hour or so to recover. So an, again, a non-epileptic seizure would be an event that mimics an epileptic seizure but doesn't have the abnormal discharge associated with it. Now they can be physiologic, meaning, the, meaning something like vagotonia. Vagotonia is where you get vasodepressor, uh, vasodepressor syncope, where your heart rate slows, your blood, your blood vessels dilate, and so you're not getting enough blood pumped to your brain. That could be a physiological non-epileptic event. Or people could have psychological events. People can have conversion reactions and all sorts of uh, psychiatric or hysterical kind of manifestations that may give them what looks like an epileptic seizure. So again, that's part of our job to go through the differential diagnosis and prove that. So if we look at the diagnosis of epilepsy when errors are made in adults, uh, the two most common ones are the psychogenic non-epileptic seizure that I just mentioned and also syncopal events. So those are the two most common things that get diagnosed with epilepsy that aren't epilepsy. So this slide uh, is very busy. I'm not going to go, every, go through every bit of it, but basically it's a functional organization of the symptoms associated with autonomic disorder. So of course we're at a conference that has to do with autonomic dysfunction, uh, and autonomic dysfunction the autonomic nervous system is sort of the vegetative nervous system that goes to every organ in the body. So what that means is that somebody with autonomic dysfunction can have dysfunction of every organ since every organ is innervated by by the brain. So you could have cardiovascular problems, you could have gastrointestinal problems, you can have problems with uh, your eye, you could have dry eyes or sluggish pupils, you can have respiratory problems where you get uh, hypoventilation or apnea, you could get altered sweating, uh, you can get urinary dysfunction, and you can get problems with uh, temperature regulation and sleep-wake disturbances. Uh, learning disability. So these are all the sort of things that can go along with autonomic dysfunction. And why some of these things sometimes get diagnosed as epileptic seizures is that, is that an epileptic seizure with a certain short circuit, if it's coming from a part of the brain that would generate, say, body temperature changes or generate GI changes, the person will have those symptoms. So I'm going to do a couple of case histories uh, today in this talk. And uh, so the first one was a 10 year old girl who had been uh, status post, that means after posterior fossa surgery for a, a brainstem tumor. So she had had a brainstem tumor removed. And after the surgery, she had been diagnosed with what was called post operative epilepsy. Uh, and this has been treated with anti epileptic drugs. 
but she presented to our emergency department one day with supposedly, an ex well, with an exacerbation of her seizures, meaning a worsening of the seizures. Now, these episodes, when you really got the history, and in medicine, history is really the most important part of everything, because as you all may may be aware, there are many times when a person has a problem, we do diagnostic testing, we don't get, an an we don't get anything abnormal. Now that doesn't mean the person doesn't have a problem, it just means that test wasn't, wasn't abnormal. So we as the doctors have to be very careful about that because what's easy to do is to do studies and because none of them come back positive, then we say, well, you don't, you don't have a problem. So, um, so when I, when I listened to her history, uh, her history was that uh, her seizures all occurred in the upright position, meaning she would get up, she would have these events, she would pass, lose consciousness, pass out, have some shaking. And these episodes were a little bit different than the post-operative episodes that she had had that had been uh, called seizures and for which she was on the seizure medication for. So whenever you get the history that something is only happening in a, in a certain situation or when someone is upright, and it's a very important thing for us to do is try to say, well, what brought this on? Are there any precipitants? Did you change position? Were you doing this or were you doing that? It's very important to find out what brought on the event. So when we heard about what brought on the event, she only had these episodes or standing up was the precipitant. So what we did were the orthostatic blood pressures on her, where we do blood pressures when someone is flat, we stand them up and we saw a marked drop in her blood pressure and it brought out the symptoms when she stood up. So what had been called seizures and for which her medications had been, uh, the seizure medication doses were being adjusted was not because of an epileptic event, it was because of a, an event that had to do with autonomic dysfunction. So I think that secondary to her tumor or to the resection of her brain stem tumor, she had secondary autonomic dysfunction. So syncope, uh, we, we've talked about that. It's relatively common. It happens in about 15 to 25 percent of children and adolescents. Uh, peak incidence is about 15 to 19 years, and uh, females predominate with syncope. So again, some definitions. Transient loss of consciousness, a loss of consciousness with a rapid onset, short duration, and spontaneous and complete recovery. Uh, and syncope is transient loss of consciousness due to cerebral hypoperfusion, meaning not getting enough blood to your brain. The symptoms are generally very rapid at onset, meaning it takes just, and so what this means is that the person may not, may not remember or may not have developed that many symptoms. And what do I mean by that? It may be that you just faint or pass out and you don't remember anything before. But if it happens more slowly, you know, and by that I mean it's not instantaneous, then the person may report a sequence of symptoms before the, they actually lose consciousness. So not uncommon when someone has a, a, a decreased blood flow to their brain that they might first complain of a difficulty with thinking, people get the feeling of being lightheaded, uh, followed by a loss of color vision or blurring. There can be a darkening of vision and even sounds can sound muffled or far away. So these might be the kind of things that you report if you've got a slow onset of, uh, of say, decreased brain, mouth, uh, brain blood flow. So different categories of syncope, there's what's called reflex or neurally mediated syncope, and that's due to uh, vasovagal situational vasovagal, meaning the vagus nerve slows the heart. That vagus nerve slowing gets activated by certain things, uh, you know, such as someone being scared, someone being frightened, blood drawing, uh, people that see the sight of blood or uh, faint at, the, at the, having their own blood drawn, uh, that's vasovagal syncope. You could have syncope due to orthostatic hypotension, meaning you don't have enough uh, fluid or your, your vessels aren't tanked up enough. Uh, there can be primary autonomic failure, drug-induced autonomic failure. There can be cardiovascular-mediated syncope. Someone has a heart, uh, heart uh, irregularity and uh, passes out. So when we see somebody with syncope, our, part of our job is to figure out what's the cause of that syncope. Um, Linda, really, 
Uh, this is a slide that has to do with uh, some, of the, some of the various things that go along with uh, syncope, which we just went over, but situational syncope. And by situational, again, I mean what were the circumstances under which the syncope happened? Well, we have here coughing or sneezing. So when you cough or sneeze, that may activate your vagus nerve, your heart rate slows, you pass out. Uh, micturition, urination, or defecation, the same thing. You're straining to urinate, you get a vagal response. Uh, cold liquids, for example, somebody, you can uh, you know, get, drink a cold drink and you pass out because your vagus nerve gets activated. Hair grooming will come to trumpet playing, trumpet playing, you're <gasps> increasing your intrathoracic, you're increasing your, the pressure in your chest by blowing the trumpet. Uh, suffocation, weightlifting, uh, diving and stretching. So these are some of the questions that when you go to see the doctor with these symptoms, hopefully they will be asking you that. Now there are certain things that really worry us and we call those the red flags. And these usually ha have to do with somebody who has a cardiac problem that is the cause of their symptoms. So if someone had a heart murmur or congenital heart disease, if they had uh, episodes with particularly cyanosis, meaning turning blue, or if syncope happened during exercise with swimming or exertion, a family history of what's called early sudden cardiac death or the long QT syndrome, sensory neural hearing loss, familial heart disease. That goes along with a disorder that's been called the long QT syndrome. So if, I, if one of my patients has that and I get the, that history, I'm sending them to a cardiologist to be sure that they don't have an underlying uh, cardiac problem. The absence of premonitory symptoms, and what do I mean by that? We just said that if events happen very quickly, you may not remember anything, whereas as if they happen more slowly. So typically, if you have a cardiac event, you may be almost like immediately unconscious, whereas if you have a vasovagal autonomic type of thing, it's generally a slower onset of the symptoms. And for the diagnosis of syncope, we're generally doing some blood work studies, uh, actually specifically uh, iron. The you know, people with iron deficiency have a much higher incidence of fainting than the general population. Uh, and when you're looking for iron deficiency, you have to not just look at the serum iron, but you should look at the, what's called the total iron binding capacity and the ferritin. The ferritin is a measure of the iron stores of the body. So iron is a very important uh, cofactor in the, in the autonomic nervous system. So we see people that have various autonomic symptoms like breath holding or fainting, and if you treat them with iron, even if they're not iron deficient, that may help with some of their symptoms. Uh, cardiac evaluation, the autonomic evaluation, including the, uh, the sweat test, the tilt test, and the, the, what's called the QSART, or the quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test. So this is a, a patient that we saw with uh, recurrent episodes of stiffening and jerking. And this is a tilt test. Um, and so what we see here is during the tilt, this is, this is actually an EEG as well. We, uh, we were doing EEGs during some of, our, some of our tilt tests in the past. So what we see here is we see uh, EEG activity, we see the heart rate here, and then you can see with the, with the person being tilted, you see actually a slowing and then a stopping of the heart rate. So with that heart rate zero, there's no blood that's being pumped to the brain, and you can see that after about one, two, three, four, five seconds, you get this slowing of brainwave activity, and then this person had about a 15 seconds of uh, electrocerebral inactivity, or what we would say brain shutdown. There was no brain electrical activity going on at that time. And what you see that person do clinically is first they get stiff, or they get what we call tonic, so there's a stiffening of their postures, and then they begin to have some jerking movements. Well, that would be what we call a tonic-clonic seizure. Tonic meaning stiffening, clonic meaning the jerking. So this person had a tonic-clonic seizure. But if you didn't get the the history that something brought it out, and at the time of the EEG, you didn't see, you, you didn't see the uh, slowing, well, you might say that was a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, the person has epilepsy, and you would put that person on an anticonvulsant, whereas an anticonvulsant is not going to help this person who's got some degree of autonomic dysfunction. So the EEG and the tilt test can be very important for this. So this slide is just to remember us uh, to, re 
to remind us that the medical history is a very important part of the differential diagnosis. Uh, so again, we want to know the, the, whether the person's had any significant past medical operate, uh, medical procedures, whether they have a family history of heart disease or fainting. Syncope runs in families. Breath holding runs in families. So we want to find that out. What position it happened in. What activity was going on. We already went over some of what we would consider to be the predisposing factors. So these are all the things that we want to know. So here's a, a patient, a patient that was sent into our epilepsy center, center for refractory drop attacks, meaning he was having episodes where he suddenly lost tone and fell to the ground. Now, he had been treated with three different seizure medications. Uh, he also had an EEG that showed seizure electrical abnormalities on the EEG. Now, I have to back up for a second and say that, uh, so what are we looking for again on the EEG? Well, we're looking ideally to capture the event that the person had. Now, that may not happen when you have what we call a routine EEG. Routine meaning about over 20 or 30 minutes. So during that EEG, we could see a normal EEG because people with epilepsy could have EEGs that are totally normal in between seizures. But we also might see what are called spikes and sharp waves. So spikes and sharp waves are the the epilep are the features on an EEG that suggest brain hyperexcitability or what we call the, the tendency for seizures. We all could have those on our EEGs, though. We know that about 3.6% of normal children can have abnormal EEGs. So just because you have an abnormal EEG as well doesn't mean that you have epilepsy. So a very important thing to take into account. But this boy had had abnormal EEGs, had been on three different medications. He also had migraines, and we'll come to that. Uh, so he, he came, he was referred to our center for consideration of epilepsy surgery because we now can do epilepsy surgery on patients if, they, if they're refractory and if we can find the spot where the seizures are coming from. So he, he was referred in for that. But when we were taking his history, the history was that these episodes only occurred when his arms were raised meaning that he put his arms up in the air and that's what brought them on. So what we did was recreate that by re having him raise his arms during, the, during our monitoring. So what we do for monitoring is we bring patients into the hospital, we put the EEG leads on them and we keep them there for days. We can do one day, we've had patients stay in the hospital for, for three or four weeks if we're trying to capture one of these episodes. And this is what we call epilepsy monitoring. So. So we brought him in, because that's what we do for epilepsy surgery. We want to capture a number of events. We would never do the surgery, particularly if we've only captured one event. And the reason for that is because we're trying to find the area of the brain where the seizures are coming from. And in order to really know that, you have to see several event, at least several events. So we bring him into the hospital. Uh, he's hooked up to the EEG. We can see his EEG waves here look normal. His heart rate is normal. He raises his hand. And you see in this video, he raises his hands and almost immediately he's got this slowing of the EEG and then his heart rate begins to uh, get slower. So he develops a bradycardia and then afterwards did have the flattening on the EEG and then he had, a, had what was called a drop attack. So we showed in this patient that even though his EEG previously had been abnormal, that his episodes were non-epileptic events and they were brought on by raising his arms above his head. So we may say, why is that? Well, people have reported what has been called stretch syncope. So when you stretch, it brings out the same physiological thing that happens when you have a, your vagus nerve gets activated. So you, some people, you stretch your arms up in the air, their heart rate slows, their blood, pressure, their blood flow to their brain decreases, and then they pass out. So we now know that stretch syncope can occur. It happens actually more commonly in people in whom there's a family history of syncope or people with migraines. So this was a patient that, uh, let me just see, yes. This was a girl that I saw a while ago probably about 25 years ago, I guess now. And she was a seven-year-old seven, seven year old girl who was referred in for a seizure. Uh, the history, again, was while her mother was removing a braid from her hair, she started, she got a complaint of a stomach pain, her back arched, and then she had about two to three minutes of a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. 
There have been no prior events, no some rare staring spells. What do staring spells tell us? Well, people could have the, the very short seizures that we call absence seizures in which they might only stare. So when we get that history, then we, say, we, we might indicate or that might indicate that the person is having other types of seizures. Uh, there was a family history that was positive for migraines uh, and she had had a normal uh, examination, a CAT scan, an EEG, and then what we call a uh, ambulatory EEG. Those were all normal. Two weeks later, when her hair was being combed again, she complained of stomach pain. She lost, screamed, lost consciousness for 45 seconds. Afterwards, seemed uh, lethargic, meaning tired, and uh, had numbness or tingling in her right foot. And then she was placed on phenobarbital because of these events. Uh, th people thinking that these were epileptic events. And then she had no further episodes until six months later when she was taken off the phenobarbital and again when her mother was braiding her hair, she had uh, stomach pain, her vision dimmed, there was loss of consciousness, ocular superversion, meaning her eyes rolled up, and she had some clonic movements of her right arm. So. It was sort of an instructive case because it made you think, well, why was this person having these events, these seizures, if you will, when, uh, when, when her hair was being braided? Well, then we saw after that uh, two or three other patients that were exactly alike. So we, wrote, we put this together when we wrote this paper called Hair Braiding and Combing Syncope. So basically when you braid your hair, it was inducing the same type of physiological response that was, was a vagal response. So she was passing out on that basis. So this is another patient that I saw, a three-month-old girl who had been diagnosed with epilepsy. Uh, she had episodes of tonic, again, tonic means stiffening, episodes that had started in the newborn period, and these were especially brought on by taking a rectal temperature or when she would have a bowel movement. She had an abnormal EEG, uh, and she had been diagnosed, well, these episodes were thought to be epileptic events, and she was started on uh, Tegretol. Uh, if I remember right, her mother had a history of vagotonia. So mother had a vagal, vagotonia, which is some degree of autonomic dysfunction, and this had started as a child. Uh, we ultimately took her off the Tegretol because we thought that she had this entity, which has now been called paroxysmal extreme pain disorder, and previously it, been, it had been called familial rectal pain syndrome because part of it had been induced in some patients by rectal spasm. They'd get rectal spasm, it would give them pain, and then they would pass out and have what, these peop what people thought were epileptic events. And so this has now been shown to be a channelopathy, a channelopathy meaning an abnormality in uh, uh, the, the brain cells talk to each other by chemicals. And uh, some of those chemicals are by activate, are activated or activate the sodium channels, some activate the potassium channels, some activate the calcium channels. So this disorder has now been, uh, uh, now been recognized to to be an abnormality in the sodium channel. So what happens with these patients, and again, it can start when they're newborns, is that they'll develop symptoms when there's some kind of pain or stress. And a lot of these little babies will get uh, color changes. They can get, uh, they can get red on one side of their body. Uh, it can happen in just one spot. They can get pale. They can get uh, uh, cyanotic. Uh, and so these are the kind of things that make, it, uh, make people think that these are epileptic events. Now, I mentioned this earlier about the iron, so I won't go over it again, only to indicate that if someone is having recurrent autonomic dysfunction, that even, uh, that even if they don't have iron deficiency proven, that iron may help them. And that's because uh, iron is important in catecholamine metabolism. Now, there was a study called the CAMERA study, and what this study looked at were cerebral abnormalities in migraine and looked at the epidemiological risk, risk analysis of this. So actually, it's, quite com or it had, it's considered to be quite common that people with migraines can faint because migraine is a neurological disorder that actually very much involves the autonomic nervous system. So there's about a 10 to 15 percent incidence of fainting in people with migraines. And uh, so they, patients can get syncope and orthostatic intolerance. Uh, so, and why do, you get, why do you get headaches? 
with blood flow abnormalities. So some of the patients, people that have autonomic dysfunction, you know, what happens? Well, if you get decreased blood flow to your brain, your brain has a thing called autoregulation where it's trying to keep the brain blood flow constant. So if you have an, if you have an episode where there's a decrease in the blood flow to your brain, your brain reads that or your brain blood vessels read that as not enough blood getting to the brain so they dilate so that they can deliver new, you know, more blood. So dilatation of the brain vessels causes discomfort or causes pain. We actually say that the brain itself doesn't, doesn't uh, feel pain. It's the covering around the brain that feels pain. And same thing with the blood vessels. The blood vessels have receptors, pain receptors on them. So what happens with, with some of these episodes is that if you get a decrease in blood flow, then you get a compensatory increase, the vessels dilate so you get a migraine-like headache. Or if you have autonomic dysfunction and get too much blood flow, such as might be the reaction to an episode of decreased blood flow, then you get a lot of blood going to your brain. Again, the vessels dilate so you get discomfort and headaches. So headaches are actually quite a common symptom uh, with, uh, with autonomic dysfunction. And this, this is a study that you probably would not be able to do anymore uh, because of, uh, you know, we, ha we have the uh, IRBs, the Institutional Review Boards that protect human subjects. But this was a study that was done about 30 years ago. And I think it's actually one of the most instructive studies that I've seen in relationship to epilepsy and seizures. And the reason for that is because I can tell you that I've seen many, many patients that are sent in over the years who have had unusual events and because they've had some degree of altered awareness or they've had some degree of motor jerking or stiffening that they're called epilepsy and then treated with anti-epileptic drugs. So this was a, a study in which they took medical students. They did 20 seconds of hyperventilation breathing in and out quickly while they were squatting. Then they quickly rose to their feet. They did a 10-second Valsalva maneuver. A Valsalva maneuver is where you, uh, where you close your glottis. So you take a breath, you hold it, you're closing your glottis, and you keep it closed. So this is actually a perfect situation for, pro for, for proving that an event is due to hypoperfusion. So it rapidly lowers your cerebral perfusion. They, they cushioned them by foam, and they had a helper hold them so that they wouldn't get hurt, and they videoed these events. So basically what they saw was loss of consciousness occurred in, in about 42 out of 59 of these patients, and 13 fell without losing consciousness. Uh, the duration was about 12 seconds, and 19 had a partial response. Uh, patients had myoclonus. Myoclonus is a very rapid muscle jerking. 90% had myoclonus. So everybody basically that has a fall who then has some twitching or myoclonus gets called possible epilepsy because people see the muscle jerking. Well, in this study, 90% of the people had myoclonus. Uh, other motor movements, they turned their head. They had uh, eye deviation, lip smacking, chewing or fumbling. These are all the questions that I ask people if I'm going to diagnose temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, so you can see that all these sort of symptoms that look like an epileptic event came out with proven cerebral hypoperfusion. Eye movements, their eyes were open in 76% and blinking happened in 50%. Vocalizations, 40% had vocalizations and the experience of syncope, uh, visual or auditory hallucinations occurred in 60% of these patients. Uh, there was a perception of a gray haze or colored patches or bright lights. Four had out of body experiences. Audit auditory hallucinations happened in 36%, but never in isolation. They were always accompanied by visual uh, uh, phenomenon. They heard rushing and roaring noises, screaming or talking voices, but never intelligible speech. And they described a feeling of weightlessness, detachment, and peace, and 17% had negative feelings. So with, with those patients, every one of those symptoms are things that get called epilepsy. And I can assure you that, I've, that many patients get misdiagnosed who have had a syncable event and then wind up on an anticonvulsant. Now, <coughs> excuse me, since we're here talking a lot about POTS, I actually want to, uh, you know, perhaps assure people that it's actually extremely, extremely, extremely rare for 
for people with POTS to have separate epilepsy. So it's actually only been reported in a single case report. So for, for something that has only happened in a reported as a single case report, we wouldn't think that there's really that much of an association. So what I'm really talking about today are, are not really saying that people with POTS have a high incidence of epilepsy, but that people with POTS have a high incidence of symptoms that if not properly diagnosed, get called epilepsy and people might wind up on anticonvulsant medications. So it comes back to doing the appropriate workup. Now, you can get an epileptic seizure from what's called an anoxic event. And we can see here, this is, this is an event where someone had a, an initial syncopal event. You can see here the flattening of the EEG like I showed in that patient with the tilt test. But here then they did have an actual electrographic seizure. So it is possible that you could have enough brain blood flow disruption to cause an epileptic seizure, but that is, that is very rare. Tongue biting. Uh, people who faint can bite their tongues. People with seizure can bite their tongues. It's actually quite interesting, but if you bite the tip of your tongue, it's more likely to go along with a syncopal event, whereas if you bite the side of your tongue, it's more likely to go along with an epileptic event. And here's an MRI of uh, the, when you do an MRI, you're generally not doing it of the tongue, you're doing it of the brain to look for brain abnormalities. But here we have somebody in whom we can see the side part of their tongue was bitten, and this would go more along with, a, with an epileptic seizure. Now, there can be some epilepsies in which there is autonomic dysfunction, so that can occur. There's something in children now called uh, Paniotopolis syndrome or autonomic epilepsy, where people, people can, have seizure, can have a seizure, and it can be a long seizure, but actually they rarely have all the stiffening and jerking and things that you think about with seizures. They have more uh, headaches abdominal discomfort. So they have sort of all the autonomic things that people with autonomic dysfunction have. It's just that it is coming from an epileptic event. And uh, I wanted to leave some time for, for questions. But thank you for your attention. So the question was, what type of workup would you do before you go to psychogenic? And so I'm going to have to ask you one more question about that, because it would depend on what the symptoms are. So what, what, what would have been the presenting symptoms? Because I guess in my mind, before I call something psychogenic, I want to have thought about almost every possible uh, neurological thing that it could be and then exclude those by the, the history or the proper testing. I really, I really don't like to make that diagnosis unless I can be abs absolutely sure as I can be that, it, that something is psychogenic. So it would depend on the symptoms. I think it was, they were guessing that just because the last two seizures I've had haven't presented like they did in the past. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying that they were not caused by epilepsy, but caused by the... Well, whenever... So we, what we say about epilepsy is that, especially if it's coming from one spot, that it's really... It's usually stereotyped, and stereotyped means that it's the same. So, yes, if someone has a change in their... Say, what their seizure is like, it would make... But, but the first question we then have to ask is, well, why couldn't it be a seizure coming from a different spot? So if let's say you had let's say you had seizures and they had been proven on an EEG to be seizures and then you had a new episode the first thing I would do would be to bring you back in for monitoring to try to see whether the new episode had, was coming from a different spot because the fact that you have a seizure from one spot, it could be highly likely that you would have a seizure from another spot. So before I would call something psychogenic, I would do that. Now, as I said at the beginning, what are we measuring? We're measuring the electrical activity that is generated to the surface. So it's certainly possible that somebody could have a seizure coming from a deep focus and it doesn't show up on the EEG. So the other thing I have to be very, very careful about is telling somebody that because I don't see a change in the EEG, that it's psychogenic. Now, that was pretty much her experience. Is she did have epilepsy starting, you know, uh, with a, a head trauma and oh. uh, at, as a teenager, uh, but had been real stable on meds, and then she had these things that 
seemed like seizures but were very different. She went in the hospital and they monitored her. That was the only thing they did. They didn't do other tests. And right. Then, and then they said psychogenic. Uh, uh, we're in an interesting situation because I'm her mother, but I'm also a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and I know I'm biased, but uh, she's a pretty stable right. kid, you know, a pretty stable person. So I just haven't, it, it just felt like more needed to be done or other, and, and that's one reason we're real interested in what might go with the POTS. Right, you know? right. Well, so when they, when they recorded her, so the next thing would be, we typically always have an e, e, EKG lead on somebody when they're in the epilepsy monitoring unit because we want to see what happens to their heart rate at the time they have the episodes. So, uh, and of course, when you have POTS, we would expect to see with POTS that your heart rate would go up. And I've seen, you know, I've seen several patients who have been admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit because they had symptoms that seemed to be the syncopal or the passing out, and then we saw that they did have POTS. But, uh, and, but the way we saw that was having them stand up and, you know, look at their heart rate and see what goes on. So, so I guess in somebody who has seizures and POTS, I would make sure that they, we did the same kind of physiological monitoring during the EEG that you might do with, some, you might do with the cardiac testing. But yes, it is, it is true that if someone has a different type of episode, then that one, one reason for that different type of episode could be that it was a, you know, a non-epileptic event. But non-epileptic events could be physiologic, a vagal response is physiologic, or a non-epileptic event could be cardiologic, or it could be psychologic. So you, someone was raising their hand in the back? Or was that for a question or a comment? So, um, I was in and out, and I apologize if you've covered this, but you've, I've, you've brought this up a few times about using vasovagal as a non-epileptic event, and while true, wouldn't you see that on the EEG? I mean, my, my understanding is you're supposed to, I mean, if you're, if you're cerebrally hypoperfusing mm -hmm. through any of the three mechanisms you just mentioned as a non, the non-psychogenic, non-epileptic mechanisms, vasovagal, cardiogenic, arrhythmia, structural cardiac problems, whatever it is, if the final common pathway is global hypoperfusion, right. shouldn't you see slowing? Oh, yes. But how many people that get diagnosed, that, I mean, that's, that's actually part of how we, how we prove, you know, how we prove that if, uh, if we go back to my slide about the, the stretching. You know, this is what we saw. The person stretched and then had slowing on the EEG. With the tilt test, the person had the tilt test, we saw slowing and then, a sl uh, then no brain activity. So yes, I would expect to electrophysiologically see that if someone had enough, enough hypoperfusion or change to cause loss of consciousness, I'd expect to see something on an EEG. Now, many people don't do EEGs during a tilt test, but uh, it can be done. Yes? Um, do you ever see like the opposite as in an increase in heart rate, almost like an autonomic storm type thing with an underlying auto autonomic dysfunction and then like, like shaking? Yes. Similar to... I mean, you can, you can see that because, of course, you could have somebody that's got a tachycardia as opposed to a, a bradycardia, and with that, you know, with, with, this, with the tachycardia, you can get release of some of the, you know, the, the brain chemicals that could give you tremor or shakiness, so yes. And you could see that with a seizure because, in a sense, as I said at the beginning, like a seizure, the, every symptom that we're talking about comes from the brain, and so if you have a seizure that's located in a certain spot, you could have that be an epileptic seizure as well. So that's, again, part of what we're always trying to uh, exclude or evaluate when we do the EEGs. And what would be uh, your best line of treatment for something like that? If someone had a tachycardia from, yeah. that it wasn't an epileptic tachycardia. Right, right. Well, I and guess, the, and they're I, not losing consciousness. Uh, well, I would send them to a cardiologist, or uh, I, I'm, I'm an epileptologist, but I would guess that they could use something like a beta blocker or something to slow your heart rate. Uh, yes? Yes. 
Well, I'll, I'll say as an aside, for, for us doing epilepsy, if people have symptoms that are, say, you know, if we've shown that something is not related to an epileptic seizure, which we would treat with anticonvulsants, then generally we would send that patient to, you know, back to their regular, their primary care doctor or to whatever specialist we thought was appropriate. Uh, yes. So, for example, if um, a patient had two different types of loss of consciousness events, like do you often see overlap where, for example, myself, I have, have um, drop episodes where I don't have any warning other than my mm -hmm. dog uh, that I'm going to faint and I just wake up on the ground. And those ones are the ones that um, I don't recover mm -hmm. as quickly from. Like, you were saying, you know, you lose consciousness and then you recover very quickly. Whereas with those events, it can take me hours to recover. Um, I have the tremors, like you mentioned, like whole body tremors for a long time. And then um, altered taste and mm -hmm. uh, just general feeling like time is going slowly. It's very hard to describe. But that kind of weirdness. Right. Uh, whereas other, what I feel like is a more typical like syncope episode where you know you get you feel like you're hot you get sweaty and then you know you feel like you need to sit down because you're getting lightheaded or whatever like those really slow faints so is that typical to have two different types well i i think partly it depends uh, you know what you're describing is that you have more than just what what people would say is simple syncope right i mean you may have some events that are more of the classic syncopal events that are short and that's usually you know something that would be more purely vasovagal mediated perhaps, but you probably all, you also have some type of dysfunction that goes on for longer. So I, I don't think that that's uncommon. But I, and again, I would think that uh, you've had EEGs and people have made sure that some of what you're doing is not an epileptic event because like I showed you, though, there, are, there are episodes that are called anoxic epileptic events where a syncable episode, you, the person may have had a syncable episode to begin with, but a cert, very small number of those patients, that, that lack of oxygen may set off an actual epileptic seizure. So with those prolonged kind of symptoms afterwards, again, that might be the kind of thing where I would want to monitor you and be sure that you don't have the, the two different things happening. Okay, yeah, because I mean, I've had an EEG, but they never, I only had one and it was normal. And they were like, oh, you're good to go. You just faint. And I was like, okay. Well, normal EEG. So a normal EEG doesn't exclude epilepsy. A normally, many, many patients with epilepsy can have a normal EEG in between their seizures. In fact, we think the number is somewhat like 50 or 60%. So the fact that you had a normal EEG really tells us that that particular short EEG showed us no evidence of epilepsy. But it, it doesn't mean you don't have epilepsy. So for particularly for recurrent episodes, we might then monitor someone and then try to ask you, are there any precipitants that bring them on? How frequently are they happening? And the reason I say how frequently are they happening is that if someone was having an episode once a year, I might not bring them into the unit and then try to capture the event. But if they're happening quite frequently, then I would want to be sure that you don't have a secondary epileptic uh, disorder. Gotcha. Yeah, no, for mine, it's usually like once, those specific ones are usually like once or twice a month. So, so once or twice a month though. Yeah. So what we, what we might do under that situation is then do what we call the more prolonged EEG on someone. And the reason for that is that, you know, if you look at a routine EEG done over a half hour, uh, that, and actually they're quite good at picking up abnormal discharges, but if we're really looking for something that's that frequent, we might do two or three days of extended monitoring. And the reason for that is that you might pick up, if someone's having uh, what we call silent or subclinical seizures, about two days of monitoring might pick up about 90% and about three days of monitoring might pick up about 95%. So for some, with those kind of symptoms, I might say do it, and we can do the monitoring now as an outpatient. We call them the ambulatory EEG, where you go into the lab, we put the electrodes on your head, you go home with like a computer chip, and then we're recording the EEG. And the reason is because 
given those symptoms, that if, let's say, we saw electrographic seizures or abnormalities over that two or three days, then we might further investigate or maybe even sometimes put somebody on a seizure medication with the idea that they're having seizures. Now, like I said, or showed that the only one case report of epilepsy in POTS, but the thing is that if you have, if you've got an underlying neurological disorder, and let's say, we, we know this from diabetes, and I'll give an example, or hypoglycemia. You know, people that have hypoglycemia can faint. But if you have episode, 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 episode after episode of hypoglycemia, that maybe that recurrent episode set up a secondary kind of epilepsy focus. So somebody might not be born with an epileptic tendency, but if you've got a, uh, uh, multiple episodes of where you've had brain hypoperfusion, it's possible that that could set up a secondary type of focus. So I would wonder about that. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. But I'd like to comment once more on your, your question about the, you know, calling something psychiatric. And, uh, you know, there certainly are, there certainly are uh, situations under which that happens. And, you know, people have that. And, you know, we see, and there's different, de there's different not degrees of it, but, uh, you know, most of the time for the younger people that we see, particularly children, you know, children usually aren't malingerers. Uh, you know, like, well, if I, if, I, if I make this statement and say I'm a pediatrician, so I like to take care of children, I, I never really like to take care of adults, I'm sorry about that. But a lot of, in adult medicine, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of things where people, you know, can do what's called malingering. But children generally don't do that. So we're actually quite, quite, quite reluctant to ever call something psychologic or hysterical or conversion without proving as best we can what it is. And that usually entails you know, again, extensive workup. Since you're a psychiatrist, I can tell you we see a number of patients who, who, I shouldn't say, when I say a number, it usually means like one or two. You know, you hear a doctor say, uh, you know, I've seen this case after case after case. Well, that usually means three. And if someone says, in my experience, that usually means two. So, but, uh, you know, we see people that come in with catatonia you know, cued onset of catatonia. And the question is, you know, how far do you go working that person up before you say that this is something that's psychiatric ra rather than something that's, uh, that's, uh, that's neurologic? And so we, we, we're generally quite extensive in the workup that we do. Yeah. And then sort of, I, I should have mentioned this, but there's now the whole thing of, uh, of uh, autoimmune disorders, and there's something called NMDA receptor encephalitis, or autoimmune encephalitis, in which patients uh, have autoantibodies to their brain neurochemicals. So, for example, the NMDA is one of the brain receptors, and that's a disorder that usually follows some type of illness or inflammatory condition. Uh, people tend to uh, you know, have autonomic dysfunction with that. They tend to have movement disorders, but they tend to present first with psychiatric kind of symptoms. And so they get called psychiatric. I mean, I've seen a couple of patients who have gone to, a, you know, gone to an emergency department with their symptoms. They're cleared, suppose, you know, they're cleared and said they're psychiatric and they go to an inpatient psych facility and then they're transferred back after they've had an actual seizure. And we find out that they've had these various autoimmune immune antibodies. At the, I think be, at the session this morning, the, um, the doctor from, I think, Mayo was talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the POTS and the antibodies and finding the antibodies to not just ganglion, but to thyroid and all other kind of autoantibodies. So I think that there's a very large, you know, percentage of people with autonomic dysfunction who have these type of autoimmune disorders. All right, well, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.